Welcome everyone to uh, ISGU GDC's spring 2017 workshop on Unity. No, it's spring. It's spring semester. Anyway, uh, I'm Ryan Krauss. I'm the vice president of the club. I've done these workshops for a while now. I'm very old. Um, you'll probably see me in the future because I don't plan on dying soon. So. Is that um, so with this we're gonna be talking about unity basics so you can all see up on the screen kind of what I see um, this is unity it looks overwhelming it kind of is unfortunately but that's why we're here so we can kind of get over those hurdles together um, Unity is super pretty powerful unity is powerful so it can do some really cool stuff but obviously there is a trade-off of easiness versus what it can do um, but it doesn't take too much time to make a game as you'll see here today um, at any point, feel free to yell at me if you have a question or you're stuck. We can stop it. I'm not a recording. Well, I, I will be a recording after you hear this later, but right now I'm not a recording. So that's good, I guess. Uh, and then hopefully after this, you guys explore on your own. I'll lead you some, like, uh, I don't want to say jump off points, but like kind of points, mechanics that you could add in the future. Um, so we're going to make it a full game, full 2D platformer that has programming, art, music, and UI. So hold on to your butts because it's going to be cool. Thanks for the laugh. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so what is Unity? Unity is basically a game engine for making 2D and 3D games. Uh, it's kind of an industry standard now at this point. You can make some really powerful games. And a lot of games you will usually see like powered by Unity when it launches. Uh, fun fact, that launches for Pokemon Go, I think, but I think they tried to hide it, but it still shows up from time to time. So I was like, I see what you guys did there. Does anyone, does anyone still play Pokemon Go? No? Okay, we got got a couple. Okay, I'm just curious. Um, the cool thing about uh, Unity is that it can publish to a lot of things. So a computer game, you know, it doesn't just have to go to a computer. It can go to your phone, iOS, Android. It can go to web. It can go to VR. It can do uh, things like the PS4, the Wii U, Xbox One, that's the other one in the family. Um, so there's a lot of different publishing options that you can do, and it's just basically you click a button and it does it for you. So it's super handy. Um, there's been a lot of games with Unity. Like I said, Pokemon Go is one of them. Another one that you might have heard of, Gang Beasts, good one. Uh, or in the Blind Forest, beautiful game, also made in Unity, and then Super Hot. I know some of you guys know that one was also made in Unity, so um, it's kind of a big deal. So that being said, if you have not yet downloaded the Unity package, go ahead and do that. But to actually begin, we're going to start a new project. Um, if you're already in the Unity like this, you can come here to File, and then New Project, and then you'll see this kind of screen up here. If you don't, up here on the top right, there's new. Click on new so you can make a new project. Um, call it whatever you want. I called mine 2D platformer example because I'm uncreative like that. Um, you can call it whatever you want. Um, and then save wherever you want. Um, that's that. Change it to 2D because we're making a 2D platformer. Um, that's that. Um, let it be known though that by selecting 2D, that doesn't mean you're locked into 2D for the rest of your life. It just sets it so up that the default view is 2D. Um, so it's basically like three button clicks to go from 2D or 3D and vice versa. And you'll see that during this workshop. Um, and after that, you can click Create New Project, and it'll kind of generate um, an empty scene for you. OK. Um, from here. Now that you're kind of in this blank project, you won't see this. Um, but what you can do is come up here to Assets. And then you want to do Import Package, Custom Package, and then go find that package you just downloaded. Or alternatively, you can just uh, kind of drag it in. And then magic happens. And I already have all the assets, but a list of all assets will come up here. And then you'll hit Import All, and then you'll get all of the assets. Um, just the things that are included are just things like pictures and music. I think there's a font in there as well. Um, and that way, we don't have to spend two hours while programmers try to make pixel art. 
because that's how long I would take. Yeah, I would just make a square, and that would still take me two hours. Um, a Unity package is just a basic zip file, um, so it's really good for like bundling assets if you want to transfer it from person to person. That's why we do this. Yes, Jacob. Did, you make this art? did I make this art? No, I did not make this art, but it's cool because it's under public domain, which means I do not need to actually credit the author. However, I will credit the author. It's, uh, it's Kenny, K-E-N-N-E-Y, and it's downloaded from his site, kenny.nl. Free assets, beautiful assets, as you can see. Um, cool. Shameless plug for Kenny. He's cool. Okay. Um, now, for Unity, looking at the layout, um, I'm going to imagine that what you see here is not what you're seeing. That's because the default layout of Unity looks, uh, looks a little like this if I remember correctly. I think it's what I see on most of your screens. Um, I don't like this one because I don't like the way it's laid out. That's just a personal thing. So I've got my own layout. But the important things to note is that you have basically five main uh, tabs open, I guess you can call them, for what Unity is. So the first one is the game tab. Um, this is what you're going to be seeing in the game. This is what, when you're playing, this is what you'll be seeing as the player. Next up, we have the Scene tab. Um, this is actually where you're going to be building your level. Um, and if I say the word Scene from now on, that's basically just the way of saving a room layout for each level of your game. Um, so we can kind of, you know, zoom out, scroll around, and we can see kind of my terrible level that we have planned for us today. Um, and then I can cl like click on stuff and can move them around and make the game possible, stuff like that. Um, the game mode, everything's static. It's just what you'll see. Scene is where you actually edit your level to make it cool and stuff. Um, next up here, we have the hierarchy. This is just a list of all game objects that are inside of your scene right now. So you can see that I've actually selected a floating platform right here. As thus, the floating platform in the hierarchy is selected. Um, and I can actually go ahead and click on other stuff. So if I click on the jewel and I double click it, it'll actually take me to that jewel in my scene view. So it's really handy like that for finding things. It does a search bar. You can search for all jewels and then, you know, stuff like that. Neat, neat, neat. Um, next up, we have the project tab. This is basically just a list of all of your files that you have in your project. That doesn't mean in your scene, that just means in your project. So for example, now that you've downloaded all the assets from the assets package, you get all the art and all the audio. It's not yet in the game, but it's there for your reference if, uh, if and when you'll need it. You'll need it for this, but you know. Um, finally, on the right, there's this inspector tab. This is actually where you look at all of the information about an object. So right now I've clicked on a jewel and we can see on the right we have our jewel. We have a transform, a component, a sprite renderer component, and a box fiber component. And I'll get into what components are. Um, they're basically just different properties an object can have. So for example, all, uh, all objects have a transform property and that's just where they're located in the world. So they have a position, they have a rotation, and they have a scale. Um, when you're moving things, you can see that the transform position is changing because it's located at a different place in world space. Magic. Um, and then the, the sprite render is just you know how we see the jewel and the box collider is just colliders for the jewel. Um, that's that. <clears throat> so if I may now uh, hit the play button up here, this is how you'll play your game. If I hit the play button, uh, I have audio. Think. There it is. Um, we can see our game. So we're, not, we're just a little dude walking around. That's a little animation of walking. We can jump up, collect these jewels to increase our score. Beautiful. There's a nice little enemy there. If we hit it, we die. The game restarts. And then uh, we get over the enemy because we're the best platformers ever. We go hit this little flag. Beautiful. And then we can walk off the stage and die again. I think this is a metaphor for life, in a way. Um, so that's our final product that we're working towards. 
Um, and by the end of today, you'll all have that um, in one form or another. Your level might be a bit different. I hope it's a bit more complex than mine, but for uh, ease of access, we'll start there. So I'm going to go ahead and start a new scene. So this is basically what you all should be seeing right now um, if you have a 2D, if you chose 2D. Um, inside of this, um, we can see our scene view is just a 2D square. Uh, by the way, this square is where our camera is. Um, so it's knowing what we can see. Um, and fun fact, up here is the 2D button. If I turn it off, our game is now 3D. Whoa! I told you it wasn't that many clicks. Um, so we're now 2D again, crazy. Um, one thing to note, if you did choose 3D for the game, um, on your main camera, there is the projection uh, property in the inspector. Make sure that's set to orthographic, not perspective. Um, perspective is basically just like, kind of as it sounds, like depth perception and whatnot. So if you see, you kind of see out in a cone area, which if I do that, you can see it's kind of a, a cone area. Um, but if I do orthographic, it's just flat. You see what you see, and now it's 2D. Um, also, this is just me. In the game tab, up here it says free aspect. Change that to be four to three. Um, what this does is it basically sets the resolution of your game. And this matters for when you're publishing your game because people might not have the same resolution. This kind of helps force it to one so it keeps constant. And uh, it'll also keep the UI in check for multiple computers. So I'm gonna go ahead and just clean up my project real quick. So I can start over. So in the project, uh, in the project folder, you should have some folders that are like audio, font, and sprites. I want you to go ahead and select the sprite folder, and then in there there should be one that's called ground. Now, if we click on this, what we can actually see is that the texture type is set to sprite, which is for 2D and UI. By the way, we're doing 2D, so this applies here. Um, if it doesn't say that, you can just select it and click Sprite. Um, and then from there, inside of our scene view, just click on the ground in the project and drag it into the scene view, thus creating a little sprite in our scene. Is that too complicated for everyone? Did I lose anyone? Okay. Um, from here, what we can do is we could create like 50 of these tiles, um, but that takes too long. So instead what I'm going to do is up on the transform, on the scale, I'm going to set the X scale to be 50. And now it's just a really long ground. So uh, click on the ground and then in the inspector, on the scale, change the X scale to be 50. Oh, to add it in, to add it in, uh, make sure you're on the scene tab and then click on the ground in the project and just click and drag it into, uh, into your scene view. And then I'll get you a one by one square. Yeah, cool. Your sprites don't have color. Wow. Yeah. Like a grid? Um, are you in scene view? Uh, up there on gizmos, there's show grid. Is that checked? See it? Scene view, gizmos. No, no. Um, okay. So if you don't have color, that is interesting. Uh, we'll fix it in post, though, so it's fine. Uh, just pretend you're colorblind. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> 
Sorry, sorry, Jacob. Sorry, Jacob. If it's just a black square, I guess that's fine. I'm actually curious as to why that is. That is. But, uh, good to know. Thank you, everyone. Clearly, I didn't test this well enough. So, okay. So now that you have either your ground, black square, etc., in here, um, again, scale it to be 50 long with the X, so it's just a big ground kind of there. And then I actually want to move this down so it's at the bottom of our camera rectangle. Um, and then in our, uh, in our game view, we can kind of see that at the bottom there is now our ground. Yeah. You did fix it? Where was that? Like here? You click on this? Okay, so apparently if you click on this, uh, this check mark and then hit apply, you get color? All right, cool. I don't need to do that because I have color, so. Too bad. Yeah, I got color, that's right. That's right. Okay. Is everyone caught up so far? Okay. I'm going to assume that's a yes. Um, also, on the ground, we're going to go over here to add component. And then a component, again, is just adding different like properties to an object. So in this case, we actually want to add a collider. Um, so that way, when we're actually standing on it, we won't fall through the ground. So I'm going to go ahead and add a box collider 2D because we're working with a 2D game. And now we can see we have a box collider around here. And one thing you might notice is if you go to scene view, there's now this very thin green line around this entire sprite. That means our collider is actually there. If I disable this, the green line goes away, comes back. Crazy how that works. Yeah. Um, come over here to click on the ground, and then you should be able to see the ground in the inspector. And then click on add component. And then I just typed in box to kind of filter the list and then select box collider 2D. And then because our ground is already box shape, uh, the collider just automatically fits to the sprite. Um, so Unity is handy that way. Um, it is possible though to click on edit collider and uh, you could edit the collider yourself. So if for some reason we want to have like a little leeway on where the ground is, we could do that as well. But I don't want to do that because this ground works for me. Um, and then just to make our game look a little bit more pretty, um, in our game, this is what we're seeing. I think the blue clashes, but that's just me. I'm a programmer. I don't know much, anything about art. So on the main camera, um, for here, for clear flags, make sure that is set to solid color, and this will make your background solid color. The default is going to be blue, but if we click on the blue and just drag it over to something like black, it just makes a solid black background. Um, like so. And that only appears in the game uh, view. That background will not appear in scene view. So as long as it appears well enough in game view, you should be good. I mean, we have yellow jewels, so that's why I didn't want to do it. OK. So now that we have our ground, what we should do is make our player. So to make a new player object, so to make the ground, what we did was we dragged in the sprite. We could do that with the player, or we could actually come over here to our hierarchy, right click, come down here to 2D object, and then click on sprite. And that creates a new sprite. Um, so there are, there are multiple ways to make sprites. You could obviously drag them in like we did, for example. Or again, we could right click 
and our hierarchy, 2D object, and sprite. And then in the new sprite, I actually want to rename this to be player, just so we can uh, know what it is and be organized. Um, and then over here in our sprites folder, we have our player sprite. Um, if you click this uh, drop down, are there three sprites for everyone, or are there only one? Three? The three? Yeah? Okay. Um, so what this actually image is, is it's just a one by three sprite sheet. Um, so if you just dragged in this image that an artist gave you, this is what would happen. And if you tried to drag in the sprite, they would all come together. So to fix that, um, over here for player, if we click on sprite editor, this brings up this entire uh, image. And then up at the top left, we can do slice and then change this to be grid by cell size, or cell count, sorry. And then there are three columns and only one row, so if I hit three and I hit slice, it would basically divide the image into these three sub-images. Um, I've already done that, so you don't have to worry about it, but for future reference, this is how you take a sprite sheet and turn it into uh, basically a cycle of animations. Yes? So to create a new sprite in your project, you can, like we did with the ground, you can either drag it in um, to scene view, or you can, on hierarchy, right-click in the hierarchy, come down here to 2D object, and then click on sprite. Okay. Okay. That you should clarify next time. Um, gotcha. Gotcha. Um, so in the sprites folder, there is a player sprite. Um, right now there's already three images because I kind of jumped ahead and gave you, uh, it already split up. However, what the image actually is, is it's just a one by three image. Um, so if you try to drag in one of them, the other two would come along for the ride. Um, to counteract that, what we can do is come up here to Sprite Editor and click on that. Um, and then if we had not already sliced this, at the top left there is Slice, and then we can change it to be grid by cell count because we know that our artist is really awesome and they made it a three by one grid of all the same size. And so we can do three by one, slice it to get these three sub images. Yeah. Uh, click on the actual sprite in your project folder. Mm -hmm. That's in your uh, hierarchy you have it selected, in your project folder, it's on the bottom. Yeah. And then click the top level sprite, like where the three are. There you go. Yep. Um, oh, and also in order to do that, you have to change sprite mode from single to multiple. Um, so that way we know there's multiple sprites located on this one image. Um, so ground, there was only one image, so we just kept that as single. Um, so now that we have our three player sprites, which are just basically standing, somewhat walking, and then really walking, I just made those up, uh, we can use the player zero, just standing sprite, as kind of our uh, beginning sprite. So over here on player, click on, uh, click on the player and the inspector will now show up. Um, and we can either click on this circle to the right of sprite, and this brings up a list of all possible sprites in our project. Um, or we can either, or we can click and drag player zero on to the uh, sprite box. I prefer using the circle method though, and I just type in like, oh, I want the player sprites. So I want that one. Neat. And now we can see our player has a nice little image to him. So that's fantastic. Now we can actually see where we're playing, which is usually helpful for the player to know where they are. Um, to add the, um, I guess, physics of our platformer, what we're going to do is add another component to our player now. Again, we're going to go make sure player is selected, and we're going to add a component. This time, it's going to be a rigid body 2D. Now, what a rigid body 2D does is it basically just adds gravity and other physics effects to it. Yes.
Um, on your player sprite, is there a drop down in your uh, project folder? So yeah, you can either drag it on to the sprite box in your sprite renderer, or you can click on the circle to let's see a list of all sprites. So we could have our player be the flag that walks around, but that doesn't make too much sense. So I'm going to stick with the player sprite. All right, got that figured out? Yep, OK. Um, so as I was saying, adding a rigid body basically adds gravity and other you know, physics stuff, magic, to it. So for example, if we actually were just hit to play right now, we would see that our player just falls down. And because we didn't do something right, they're just falling now into space. Poor player. They're gone forever. Not a very fun game. So to actually have collision work, um, we've already added a box collider to our ground, but we also need a box collider on the player because we need to know that if those, if at any point those boxes touch, they cannot go through each other. So like we added the box collider 2D to the ground, we're going to go to the player and we're going to add a component again, which is just going to be the box collider 2D. And if we did it right, we can see that as we click it on the player, we now have a green box kind of around the player where our uh, collider is. And again, if we were to hit play now, we could see that as we're falling, we now actually land on our platform. So whenever you're doing collision, make sure that both things that are going to happen the collision, so in this case the ground and the player, should have a box collider. Or any collider for that matter. Say it again? Um, like if you're saying that we just started it like right here? I think what would happen would be it would try to shoot it out of itself. Um, like for example, if I if I uh, tried to fit inside of a chair, ow, first of all, um, but obviously one of those like something has to move. So I guess let's just find out. I, it'll either fall or it'll either get shot out. So yeah, it just pushes it. Um, yep, yeah, it'll just push it out of there. Um, and like this one is like more than halfway to the top, but I'm sure that if we moved it more than half at the bottom, it would just shoot down instead. So, good question. If it's directly in the middle, I think it just flips a coin, but I don't know. Um, feel free to test that on your own. Um, one thing you may have noticed for our platformer is that our collider is not that the best. So, for example, it kind of looks like our dude is hovering just a few inches off the ground. So, to fix this, we can go up to our player again, our box collider, and then hit Edit Collider. And then we'll see just kind of some squares so we can drag and kind of drag our drag our box around so we know where they're standing. And I want to do it just a little bit above the feet so it kind of looks like our feet is kind of in the ground, if you will. Um, and feel free to kind of play around with the collider. Um, it's as best it's as, only as good as you make it. So, and some of this does take a little bit of testing. So. Figure out what works best for you. But now that I've edited the collider, we kind of see that, OK, it looks like we're actually standing on the ground now. So that's fantastic. Um, one final point I want to do with the player is on side the rigid body 2D, there is a constraints kind of, uh, I don't know, this isn't really a drop down, I guess an option menu. Uh, if you click on constraints, there is a checkbox that says freeze rotation Z and we're going to check that because what I've discovered is that if at any point you're kind of unbalanced you will fall on your face and uh, we don't want that so we're just going to make sure that the player is always standing upright by checking this box um, you'll notice that there are other constraints such as freeze position X and Y but that doesn't make much sense for our platformer or else 
we wouldn't be able to move. But there's there's reasons why it's there. I'm not going to get into that, but just let that know that that's an option. So now it gets to the fun scripting part of the the lesson. No, um, <laughs> not quite. Um, so we're going to go ahead and create a new script. Uh, if you know anything about me, it's that I like C Sharp and not Unity Script. So that's what we're going to be doing here today. So um, if you don't have a scripts folder, I don't think you do. Um, you can create this anywhere, but I have a scripts folder because I like to be organized. So in our project folder, I can now right click and then do create. And then there's a list of other things that great, but the very top is a C Sharp script. And I'm going to call this one player movement because I'm original like that. And this will basically just generate a basic script for you to kind of edit to your heart's content. If you're not a programmer or you haven't done that much programming, um, just try to follow along as best as you can. Um, again, if you need me to clarify something, let me know. Um, and if you don't understand this, that's totally fine. Um, it's just the things that you'll learn through your Unity adventure. So I'm going to go ahead and double click on the script to actually open it up to edit it. Um, and this is going to open up in uh, Mono Develop, so we can edit it there. Um, this will take a second, but um, you might have noticed that depending on where you right click, so in the in the hierarchy we could right click to make different objects like 3D and 2D objects, and then inside of the project you could right click to make things like you know scripts, uh, scenes, materials, etc. Um, so just let it know that. Depending on where you making new stuff, it changes. So just be aware of that. Um, so I've got a uh, mono develop opening it up at its own pace because it likes to torment me. So I'm sure. What? What? I'm pretty sure mono develop comes with Unity. That is interesting. That's weird. Um, you could open them in Notepad, I guess. Notepad++, I think that's on there. Um, the only downside of that is you won't have autocomplete, so just uh, work as best as you can um, in that sense. But now we've opened up our player script, and this is the default that you'll see for every single script um, that you ever create. Um, we have our class, and we have two methods. We have a start method and an update method. And the lovely people at Unity comment this so we know exactly what's going on. But in my opinion, at a certain point, it just wastes two lines of code. You know, no one counts lines of code, but it's two free lines of code that you just don't need. It's wasting space, computer memory, I don't know. Okay, so start method, as they say, is use this for initialization. And now start method only happens once, and that's when the... Uh, game starts, um, or when the object basically creates itself, uh, in this case at the start of the game. So this is where we're going to be doing things like initializing variables, and this is where you can do some other stuff, but mostly it's just for saving variables for later use. Update, on the other hand, is called once per frame, as it says, and um, most games they run like 30, 60 frames per second, so you're, you know, basically doing a frame every 0.08 of a second, if I remember correctly what it is. Um, so this, long story short, this happens a lot, very frequently, to make sure there's not much uh, lag in your game. Um, and this is where we'll be basically like moving the player and uh, doing other logic that needs to be checked every frame. So to begin, at the top of the class, in the class, uh, above the start method, we need to create a variable so that we can save it for later use. So I'm going to type in uh, private uh, rigid body 2D, and then I'm going to call mine RB. Now, what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be saving the component of the player, in this case, the rigid body 2D, 
uh, to our script so we can use that to move the player around. I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, so first things first, we need to actually get the component uh, from basically the inspector to this script. So to do that is RB equals get component. Um, and then you have to do the weird angle brace. Um, and inside of that, we're going to type in rigid body 2D, close angle brace, and then empty parentheses to finish it off. Now, this is going to be true for every single thing that you do in Unity that uses get component. If you ever need to get a component off of the object that the script is on, this is the way to do it. Um, the only thing that's going to be changing from time to time is whatever is inside of those angle braces. In this case, it's a rigid body. Um, you'll see throughout this that we'll do other things like an animator, audio source, etc. Um, and we'll see how that works in the future. But this is basically a way of saving that component to be used in the script. So now that we have actually have access to it, now that we've gotten it, inside of update, this is again what happens every frame, we're going to be checking input from our player and uh, basically moving them based off that input. So because it's called RB, because I that's what I called it, we're going to do RB dot, and then we have a list of all the different methods that the rigid body has. The one I'm looking for is velocity. And for those that haven't taken physics yet, velocity just means more or less how fast you're going in a certain direction. Um, and then I'm going to say equals, and I'm going to type in new vector2. Now, a vector2 is basically just an array of two values, in this case, x and y. Um, and if you couldn't figure out, this is going to how we're going to tell if we're going left to right, up or down, or even diagonal, because we have that power. So inside of the vector2, uh, first we have to take care of the x. Um, and we're just going to be using um, kind of left and right and A and D to move our player. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in input, capital I, and input class is just a way of getting, you know, input from the user, whether it be the mouse, keyboard, Xbox controller, etc. Um, but what I want to do is I want to do dot, and then I'm going to do get axes, and then in the parentheses, I'm going to do horizontal to say that we want to use left and right or A and D. This is already built into Unity, so you can just use this at any time. Um, you are free to make your own keyboard layouts, I guess. Um, but um, horizontal and then vertical is the other one that uh, I don't think we use in this, actually. But you can use vertical as well. Yes, yeah, Zach? Okay. Um, so this is... So what input get axes returns is it's going to return basically negative 1, 0, or 1 when you're using a keyboard. Um, negative 1 will be, I think, left, and then 1 would be right. Makes sense when you think about it. Um, but that's not fast enough for me. So I actually want to multiply this by 5 because I like to go fast. There it is. Okay. Um, and that is just the x value. So we're going to put a comma to now, and it even kind of gives me a hint like, hey, you're on the y value now. Um, and since we're just using this to check to see if we should be moving left or right, we just want to keep the, our y velocity the same. Um, so if we're falling and we're moving left or right, we don't stop falling for some reason. So I'm just going to type in rb.velocity.y, and that just basically saves the uh, same velocity that it already had for the y position. Um, Kind of a side note, don't type this out. Uh, you can keep typing the line above, though. But there is a way to like do rb.velocity.x. Um, some of you might be wondering why we can just do like equals input get axes times 5. Um, the reason why we can't do that is because uh, velocity.x is a read-only value, which basically means that if we want to replace it, we have to replace both the x and the y at the same time. It's just... Uh, way to optimize uh, how Unity handles stuff. So this is not something that we can do. So instead, we just have to save rbvelocity.y back to rbvelocity.y. One of those tedious things you got to worry about, but that's that. 
Um, so now we should be able to move left and right, no problem. But uh, in a platformer, you do usually jump. So we're going to add that functionality as well. Um, and I do apologize that this is going to be a little weird. So uh, I'm going to type it out and say it out as I'm typing it. And then I'll actually go through it and kind of explain what's happening under the hood here with, uh, with some visuals, because we can do that. So first things first, I want to actually check to see if at any point is uh, if the user is inputting the space bar. Um, and to do that, we'll do the input again. But instead of doing get axes, we'll do, uh, we'll do get key down. And that only happens kind of when they push it. So if we're holding down the space bar, they're not infinitely jumping. Um, there's also a get key up for other things as well. But we're going to be using get key down. Then in the parentheses, um, it kind of already auto-completes that I'm looking for a key code. And if I just type, if I just hit enter, it fills in the key code. And then I want key code dot. And then I'm looking for key code dot space. There is a key code for literally everything. So if you don't want to use space bar, you can use something else. However, I would not use A or D because that's kind of preserved for left and right movement right now. But yeah, the button's good. You can even use up if you want to. But use what? Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> your call, your call, man. Um, but that's first things first. We should check to see if uh, our if any, if at any point we hit the space bar, we're gonna jump. Um, but in a platformer, only, you can usually only jump when you're on the ground. Now, I kind of like flip flop on how the best way to kind of check if you're on the ground or not is, and none of them are easy, none of them make sense, but this is the one I've chosen for this workshop, so please bear with me. Um, so I wanna make sure that both, we've, we've hit the space bar and we're on the ground. So we do the double and because that's what we do in programming. And then what I'm gonna type in now might confuse you, but I'm gonna type in physics 2D, and then I'm gonna do dot overlap uh, if I can spell it right, overlap circle. And then inside the parentheses, I'm going to do transform.position uh, minus new vector, should turn that over, minus new vector 3. And then in there, I'm going to put 0, 0.6f, 0. 0 and then comma 0.05f and like i said i'm sorry i think i have an extra one in there yep okay so this whole physics 2d overlap circle thing is the devil but what it's basically doing is it's going to be checking if at any point um, if we have a circle if that circle ever overlaps a collider in our game. And the first argument is the position, and the second argument is the radius of that circle. So what I'm basically doing is I'm trying to find a circle that is located at the position of transform.position, which by the way is our center position, and I'll show that in a second, minus new vector 3, 0, 0 0.6, and 0. Now what that is simplifying is that is basically down, because that's minus y direction, um, about 0.6, which is more than half of our character size, our character is the size of 1. So if the middle is 0.5, if you will, minus 0.6 is below our feet. And then I just chose a radius that was small enough to do the job. Um, and then don't, uh, don't write this down if you don't want to, but just so we can kind of visualize this. Um, there is a nice little trick that what we can do is use a, something called a gizmo to, uh, I can just copy this. Uh, we can use a gizmo to kind of visualize what's happening here. Um, that needs to be void, that's why. So I basically just copy pasted all of the same logic from above. And now if I hit play, it should work. 
Um, inside of our, oops, fun fact, if you have maximize on, maximize on play uh, checked, go ahead and uncheck that for this exercise. Um, but if we hit play and switch back to our scene view, um, it is not there. That's a shame. Let me check, make sure I got my commas right. I don't. All right, let's try that again. Um, essentially what this is doing is it's just making sure I don't know why that's not working. Um, what this is going to do is it's going to draw a sphere at this position and it's going to make sure that this is just a way to visualize what is going to be happening. Uh, you don't have to write this down just to clarify. This is just a way to visualize. You know, I don't know why that's not working. It's exactly what I have. You know what? I just forgot one important thing. So, after you make a script, be sure to add the script to the player. You can all laugh at me now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, so on the player, Again, we're going to add another component, and this time it's going to be the player movement script that, we, uh, that we've added. So now all of this logic that we just typed out here is going to go into effect. And you feel free while I'm going through this to uh, kind of, you can see that we can now walk around. Um, we didn't put actually any uh, logic into the spacebar yet, but that's because I wanted to show you this. So in the scene view, we can see now there's this little little circle um, and that's what I was trying to figure out while it wasn't working, but that's because I made another error on my part, so I apologize. But what it's doing is this is where it's checking to see if at any point this circle is overlapping another collider. So at any point, this circle is overlapping a collider. In this case, it's going to be the ground collider. We should be able to jump. Um, so for example, if we're falling, if we're in the air, like right here, we should not be able to jump because the circle is not overlapping the collider. Um, if you don't understand all of that, that's okay. Um, physics are weird, both in Unity and in real life, as I'm sure some of you who have taken physics know. Um, but to finish up the script, um, inside of that if statement that has the uh, if get key down and the physics overlap circle. Um, all we have to do is we want to update the velocity of the player again, but this time, so rb.velocity, we're going to set now to be another new vector 2, um, and then our x value is going to stay the same because this logic is just taking care of jumping. So we don't want to stop moving left or right whenever we start jumping. And then uh, just choose a random up amount. I prefer 7 because it seemed to work for me. So not 700, uh, 7 uh, to kind of... So every time we hit the uh, space bar, we shoot up at a velocity of 7 but gravity makes sure that we don't stay up there for too long and we come back down. Um, when you're working, especially with a platformer, um, you really need to kind of, I don't wanna say guess and check, but test to make sure that your everything's kind of logic out. Uh, if I can do a personal anecdote while you're all writing this down, um, there was one platformer that I had where we designed the platform mechanics, we had the jumping, all that fun stuff, and then it got to the point where we were actually designing the level. And this was a game jam, so we were kind of pressed for time. Um, but the, the platformers, we realized, had to be about like half a unit above each other because our platformer person couldn't jump high enough. So it basically just became a kind of ramp kind of thing. So that's why, fun fact, the, I guess, physics in Mario, where he can jump like, seven times his height uh, are useful. Um, so if you try to make a realistic platformer, don't, I guess. 
I don't know. You can, but uh, just be aware that you'll have to, you know, level design and mechanics have to work together. So that being said, feel free to change seven to be whatever you want. Just make sure it's tall enough to reach the platformers or the platforms when you design your level. Okay. Does everyone have this written down so far? I'm going to assume yes. Um, so now if we go ahead and play again, um, you should be able to see that we fall to the ground, we can walk around, and hey, look at that, we can jump. And if I, if I mash space, I'm only jumping once, which is fantastic because that's exactly what we're supposed to be doing. So... Now that all that fun scripting stuff is out of the way for now, um, we're going to kind of take a sidestep to art now. Um, you might have noticed that as we're walking around, we're just kind of moonwalking around, not even really walking. So to kind of make it look like our player is walking, we want to make an animation for when they are walking. And we want to keep them kind of standing when they're standing still, of course. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here to uh, make sure the player is selected in your hierarchy. And then up here on Window, I'm going to choose Animation. That's Animation, not Animator. Animation. There's a difference. Um, and it creates this new tab, which I'm just going to drag up here. What you'll see now is it's basically saying we don't have any animation. So you can just hit the Create button, and it will create its own. I'm going to say this as player animation. And now we can actually do some stuff in here. So um, again, if, you're not, if you don't see this animation window, come up here to window and then animation. Or you can hit control six for those who don't want to use their mouse for some reason. Um, and then make sure you click on player and then click on the create button below to actually create um, an animation for this. Um, and what it actually did was it created an animation and then an animation controller, which we'll get to in a second as well. But we actually want to go ahead and make two animations in this case. One of them, I don't know if you'd classify as animation, but this will just be our kind of idle state of just standing still. So I don't think that's an animation, but we're going to call it anyway. Um, so to do to make an animation, we're going to come back to our sprites folder in our higher in our project folder, and on our player sprite, click the drop down so you can see all three of them, all the three sub images at the same time. Um, and because we want uh, the player sprite zero to be our stand animation, we're just gonna click and drag it. Uh, I think, yeah, click and drag it uh, into our animation folder and make sure player is selected uh, while you're doing that. Um, and this is just going to be our single sprite that will loop for all of infinity whenever we're standing still. So, fun fact, we haven't actually changed our game. We just, we didn't do, we didn't do anything. So that's fantastic. Um, so that is going to be our idle animation. And then if we hit play, it's basically just trying to display that one sprite at 60 frames per second. Hint, it's succeeding because the sprite is not changing. And you can kind of see a little, little jitter there. So, yes, thank you. I, uh, I'm really using the full power of my HP laptop. Um, but now where we get to the point of actually creating a real animation, if I dare say so, um, over here it says player. Um, player might actually not have been the best name because this is going to be our player idols animation. But now we're going to actually create the walking animation. So where it says player, we're going to create a new clip. And in this case, we're going to call this one walking, because that's what we'll be doing. Um, and again, you can switch through, uh, switch between the two at any time. But for now, make sure you're in the walking state. Um, and to do this, I'm actually going to just uh, select all of them at the same time and just drag them all in. Now if I zoom in, we can just see that we have our three sprites standing, semi-walking, really walking, and that'll just loop forever as well. Um, 
One thing to note is that the default sample rate is 60 frames per second. We only have three frames right now, so you don't need to go that fast. I found that 10 is a totally reasonable time frame to go through. Um, and then because I kind of want this animation to loop, um, because we start standing, we do legs slightly apart, and then we do legs really apart, this animation is going to loop between uh, together, slightly apart, or really apart, and then back to standing. So I want to put like this one again so it kind of segues i guess correctly so i'm going to click on player one sprite because that's the midpoint sprite and just drag it right on there so now we actually have four sprites but two of them are the same reuse is very good for a lot of games and uh if i go ahead now and i hit the play button it's orange which means that it's going to be never mind it changed back um but if we hit the play button again, oh, well. Uh, we'll see what that looks like in a second. But uh, now we have our four sprites uh, animation for walking. Yeah. Uh, what is the uh, I said 10. 10 was a good rate. Um, again, feel free to figure out what works best for you. But don't make it 60 because that's just like... I, I was very surprised when it happened the first time. Um, so now that we have our two clips, uh, our idle state and our walking state, what we should do is we should take a look at the animation, animator controller. Um, so there's two ways to get to there. Uh, in the window, there's animator that you can click on to get to uh, here. That'll be there. Um, or inside of wherever you save that first player animation, it would have also created the controller. It's the thing with like the the play button and then a lot of squares and lines going to it, which is, is kind of what this is looking towards. But uh, but get to here and make sure you have the player selected so you're on their controller. Um, and this is kind of, I think, what it should look like for the most part. Um, since you made both the clips on the uh, player, we have our walking and idle. Um, it should know that we have two uh, states within the state machine. Um, and just to, you know, make things simpler, uh, I'm going to rename player to be idle because I did a terrible job of naming that before. Um, and I can move these all around. And for those, that, yeah. Nope. Not that I know of. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how to even drag without a mouse, to be honest. I think it's... Okay, it's alt and then move around. So have fun with that. If you don't have a mouse, I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah, but uh, here is our two sprites. We don't have that big of a state machine. Also, I mean, you can pop this out and then I think resize it if you want. If you want more room. Hey, there's hidden state over there. I didn't even know about. Um, not important though. Um, I'll leave that over there. So. We have our idle state and our walking state. Now, idle is orange because that is going to be our default state. Uh, it's only orange because we made it first. So, for example, if you made the walking state first, walking state would be orange. Um, our default state is basically our starting state, if you will. Um, and we don't want to start walking. We want to start idle. Um, if you did want to change a state to be default because you made it in the wrong order or you just have a new state that's a new idle state, I don't know. You can right click on the uh, rectangle of your uh, animation and there's one that says set layers default state and that just makes it orange which means it's our default state and you can even see there's now an arrow going from entry to walking but we don't want that so i'm going to head back to idle so all that's going to happen now is when our game starts it's going to go to immediately to idle and it's never going to change so what was the point of making the walking animation good question unknown voice what we can do is on idle, we can make a transition from idle to walking. So I'm going to click on make transition here, and that'll give me an arrow, which I can connect to. It's only walking state in this case, which is good because that's where we're going. Um, so right now there is a transition from idle to walking. So if we ever start walking, we can change the animation that way. Um, obviously, we want to wait back. So I want to click on walking now, make transition, and go back to idle. 
So now there's kind of a two-way street uh, happening here. Now in order to know when to do this transition, we need to add a parameter. So up here on the top left, there's, I think my, mine's on layers right now, but there's parameters right next to it and it says list is empty. So we want to add something to this list that will kind of, uh, so we know when we need to make this change. So I'm going to hit this plus button and we're given four options, float, int, bool, trigger. I'm going to go with bool because that's the one I chose. Um, trigger is basically just like you trigger it and then it just happens. Um, it's kind of like a bool except it's only true for one frame. So feel free to use that to your advantage if you need it. Float, int, uh, or self-explanatory. Bool is true, false, which we'll look at in a second. And I'm going to call this one uh, is moving because uh, we want to know if we're moving or not. Very creative, again, if I do say so myself. Now that we have this parameter, we need to actually supply the transitions with these conditions to, I don't have another ish in rhyme, so to do that movement. So click on one of the arrows, and I'm going to click on idle to walking. So when we click on that, the bottom, the conditions list is empty. So I'm going to hit plus, and it's already going to fill out is moving, and it's going to fill out default to true, which is actually exactly what we want, because if we're idle and is moving becomes true, that means we need to start playing our walk animation. So that's already done. Now on the back side, on the way back, walking to idle, we're going to add another condition, but this time we want is moving to be false. So whenever we stop moving, we're going to change our animation to be the uh, idle state. One thing to clarify, or I guess point out on uh, this, is that on the transitions, there's this has exit time button, or check mark, check box. I want you guys to uncheck that for both of the transitions because what that does is if you have a, if you have an animation and that has has exit time checked, what it will actually do is it will play the full animation before it changes state. And that's not always the best thing. For example, uh, in this case it won't be too bad because we only have four images and they're cycling pretty fast. But if you had an animation that was you know, maybe three seconds long, and you wanted to change out of that animation really quick, it would have to continue and finish that three second animation before changing the next state. And sometimes you don't always want that. So make sure has exit time for both of those transitions are unchecked. So now that we have our animator controller kind of set up for the artist, go ahead back to our player movement script. And now, what I want you guys to do is, before I do that, I want to show you the, um, back to the player inspector. So what happened in all of that is, by clicking create, we added an animator to, uh, to our uh, player uh, component. So what happened was, we now have our player controller on by default. And if we click on that, it takes us exactly to the state machine which has our idle and walking animations on it. So what we need to do is we need to, if you remember correctly, we get component of that uh, animator so we can know when to check or uncheck is moving. So again, I'm gonna create another variable and this one's gonna be uh, an animator because that's what it's saved to. And I like to abbreviate just to anim. Feel free to call it whatever you want. And then, in, again, in start, we need to actually get this component and save it for later use. So, anim equals get component. Same thing, except this time in the angle braces, we're going to be typing animator, if I can spell it right. There it is. Um, so, a good, I guess a good rule of thumb is just make sure whatever is inside of the angle braces matches the variable that you're saving it to. Or type that you're saving it to. Okay. So now that we have that done, we only have to actually add uh, one line. So inside of update, what we have to do is we have to do anim, because that's what we saved it again to. And we're going to do dot set bool, because we created a boolean parameter in our controller. So I'm going to uh, do that. And I can see that we need to pass in a string, which is the name of the condition, and then a value for that condition. So I'm going to, we call there is moving. Um, make sure you type it correctly. 
or else it will not find it. So if you call it something else, uh, plan accordingly there. Um, and then we want to make sure if we're moving or not. And the easiest way I found to do this is uh, all we have to do is check to see if the velocity of x is not equal to zero. And if basically if we're moving left or right, we'll have a velocity that is not zero, um, which uh, will return true. Magic. It's all magic. Um, and if we go ahead and save that and run it, um, not hit pause. If we go ahead and run that. We can now see that as we're walking, our little dude is walking. So, I have our Michael Jackson up in here. We can actually use our legs. Um, one other, I guess. I don't want to say like Easter egg, but one little cool thing we can do is right now it looks like our player is always looking right. Um, one thing we can do is instead of having our requiring our artist to make a whole new set of sprites for walking left, we can actually flip our sprite. Um, there's a couple ways we can do this, but by far the easiest is to actually change the scale of our player. Now, all we have to do is change our x value to be negative one, and it looks like now our dude is looking left. And all of the animations will follow this same scale. So if we go back to one, make it negative, and we can kind of see is Okay, you get the picture. Um, so to kind of reflect that within the code, um, we're just going to do a simple if else statement block, um, and we're just going to check to see if uh, if the x value of our velocity is greater than zero, that means that we're moving right. So we want to change our transform scale. In this case, it's going to be local scale. Uh, we want to make that equal to a new vector 3, 1, 1, 1. And then we also want to check, um, else if the velocity is less than zero, we're going to do the same thing except it's going to be a negative 1x. I'll let you type all that out. One thing you might have noticed is that um, we've kind of been going back and forth between vector 2s and vector 3s. Uh, vector 2, because we're working with 2D stuff, um, we don't need that z uh, value in most cases. Um, but even though uh, that this is a 2D game, technically, all of our transforms, all of our sprite locations, they still have a z value, even though they're all zero. Um, it's just something that Unity wants you to work with. So we don't. Have, uh, that's why we're doing vector 2 and vector 3 in some cases. OK. Um, and then just to point out also, like there is no rb.velocity.x equals equals 0 because we don't need to change whatever way we're looking just because we stopped. So just let that be known. Um, and just to kind of look at what that looks like, now as we move left and right, we're kind of looking like we're actually moving left and right. So just a little nice little artistic design thing to make it look like your game is actually well designed. So fun fact. Okay. Um, one thing you might notice is that, yeah. yeah. Um, one thing you might notice is that um, our player can kind of walk off the screen. So if you kind of were to move left or right, you would just keep walking and the cam wouldn't follow you. Um, so there's a couple ways we can do this. Um, but for the purposes of this demo, I want to basically just add another script. Um, it's three lines, four lines, so it's not too bad, but it'll kind of display some cool stuff. So we can see, we can just walk off. We're still there because we can come back, but we obviously want to see where we're going. We don't want to limit our level to be like, I don't know, like 15 tiles long. You could, but it's very, very small, and you have to have a lot of levels then, I think.
But anyway, um, so I want to make a new script. Um, and it's going to be for the camera to follow our player. So I'm going to go back to our scripts and just make a new C Sharp script. Um, again, by right clicking inside of the project folder, create C Sharp script. And uh, I'm going to call this one just camera follow because, again, still on creative. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open up that script as well. It might just be faster just to go this way and do this. And if you all see my terrible, ah, all of my hidden projects that are all secrets, no one can tell them. Okay. We open this up. Again, we're welcomed back to the good old default start update script. Um, fun fact, we don't even need start in this case, so feel free to do away with it. It's gone forever until you, you know, control Z or something. But one thing we want to do with this is we want to make sure that the camera is always in line with the player, at least within the, uh, the X value. So as we're moving to the right, the camera is moving to the right, and same thing for the left. What this doesn't do, however, is if the player is jumping, the camera doesn't jump with the player, which for a platformer can be very nauseous if it, you know, if it's one to one like that. Um, the only uh, er, so to do that, one thing we have to do is I'm going to make a new variable called uh, player object, and this is going to be a public game object, player object, and this is going to be the player in our game that it's going to follow. And I made it public for a reason, which I'll show you in a second. So go ahead and follow that. Um, and then kind of the same reason why we couldn't uh, just change the X or Y value of the rigid body by itself. Um, we have to do the same thing for position. So I'm going to get the position of the camera and save it to its own vector three. And then I'm going to set the X value of that position to be the same X value of the player object. And that'll make it so that the player is directly in line, or the camera is directly in line with the player. And then at the end, we have to go ahead and set that position back to this transform. So this is the entire script in its entirety. Um, we'll have to do a little more, I guess, housekeeping in a second, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, I had another point, but I lost it, so that's that. Um, oh, yeah, if you want to kind of expand off this in the future, you will have to make changes to this uh, camera script, especially if you want to have like a climbing segment or if you want to have platformers that kind of go above the screen. Um, you'll have to do some camera magic for that um, because as of right now, this camera will just follow the ground as you're moving left and right. So. Keep that in mind if you ever want to expand based off this. Okay. So, on the main camera, because I remember now, we actually have to attach the script. So, main camera, click on that, and click on add component. And then we're going to add the camera follow script to uh, the camera. One thing you might notice now is that this script has a variable that says player object. By the way, it's the same player object that's right here. Uh, that's what making public does. It basically makes it publicly available from the inspector. And it's useful for that because since we're looking to follow the player object, instead of doing a lot of weird find the player and save its reference and stuff like that, we can just click on the player and drag it right there. And now we have a direct reference to it. Um, again, you can drag and drop, or you can click on the circle and just select player from the list. And now what this is going to do is it's always going to make sure that the player is in the middle of the camera. Obviously, we have no reference to anything else, so it doesn't look like we're moving at all, but we can see that we're moving, especially from inside of the transform. You can see that the position is moving as we are moving. So that's that. Simple script to keep the player, to keep the camera in line with the player. So 
to kind of add a little more reference to our game, if you will, um, we're going to add some more uh, flying platforms for us to jump on. Because after all, what would a platformer game be without any platformers? Someone play Bubsy? No, okay. That was a Bubsy reference. It's a Bubsy reference. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so inside of our uh, sprites folder again, I have one that's just called floating platform, which we can go ahead and drag in, and it's just there. Um, and I'm going to drag in one for right now. And, uh, you know, we'll just kind of reposition uh, it where we want to. Um, and we'll go ahead and just put it in. And uh, that looks like good height, and I'll just try to, whoops, can't, not quite, nope, just, just, just nope, nope, not quite, can't get up there. So what am I missing here? I just dragged in a sprite, how come I can't land on it? This is the, this is the open part. Box collider, correct. There's no collider on this ground. Um, there are other types of colliders in addition to box colliders. There's circle colliders and... I don't know, other colliders that I can't think of right now. But um, in this case, we actually want to add something called a polygon collider. And the reason why we're going to do this is because you'll notice that our ground is kind of curved at the bottom. So if we had a square box collider, um, we, there would be like a weird corner where it would kind of like, your head would kind of clip empty space and they'd be like, oh, why did I stop? And you get one out of five stars on congregate. I don't know. Whatever. Um, so you can do a polygon collider, and this lets you have more freedom as to the way your uh, collider is. And you can see that it kind of did its best job as trying to mold a collider around that. Um, it's not good enough, in my opinion. So what I can do is I can click on uh, Edit Collider on the Polygon Collider, and it lets me actually kind of drag my own stuff. And I can even click in the middle to make to make some new points like this. So. You want to make it, you know, a bit better. You know, it's good enough. It's better, I'd say. It's not the best, but it's better than that. Um, so now you can, and you can play around with that as much as you want. Um, I mean, this is good enough for a game. I don't think many people would care about this if it was uh, anything like that. So now that we have our platformer, we should be able to jump on it. I'm going to go ahead and jump on it. Yay, we did it! I'm on top of the world. I'm on, nope, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what you should do now, now that we have this uh, one platform, is you can actually go ahead and just copy-paste this uh, platformer. Um, I'm going to switch back real quick. So just select it, Control-C, Control-V, copy-paste, and then you can just kind of make a nice little... Nice little row of platforms to jump on, like so. You good, Zach? Zach, you good? Okay. Okay. And then, you know, we can see that we have a nice little row of platforms that we can get to. And now that we have a reference, we can kind of see that the camera is not actually fact moving with us. Yeah. Good question. I will get to that. Uh, the question was, uh, if you kind of run into the side, uh, let me see if I can time it just right. You kind of, you kind of get stuck like this as long as you run into it. Uh, we'll address that in, in a second. Um, for now, just kind of bear with it. So, good question though. Read my mind. <laughs> what, do you, what do you need, Zach? What do you need? Did you attach the script? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, what do you mean? Yeah. So that, that brings up a good point about the rigid body. Um, the X and Y are in relation to the actual world space. So X is always left and right, Y is always up and down. So even if we did fall over, we would still keep moving left and right, and we would jump kind of 
using our face as a launch pad, I guess. Um, to stop the movement, um, if you fall over, um, you would have to basically keep checking um, if the rotation of the player ever was not zero, 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 then you could stop the movement. Um, or the way we stopped it was just by clicking freeze rotation on the rigid body. Um, multiple ways to do it. This is the by far the easiest one. Yep, so if it's, if since it's checked right now, that means as I'm playing the game, I can't rotate the player like this. Um, I think if I were to uncheck it, and I were to go stand at, uh, there we go, that happens. And then you can see I can still I can still move fine. And then if I, I think, tilt a little bit, I can land on my head. <laughs> again, again, this is a metaphor for life. Um, <laughs> yeah, so what I would do is I would put all of this inside of an if statement and then have something like if transform dot rotation um, that dot equals angle oh yeah dot equals no I don't know if I can do this uh turn that identity um, so as long as the rotation is I guess equal equal to zero um, Quaternion identity is just a fancy of Wayne saying zero 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 rotation. So what you could say is as long as the rotation is equal to this, we can still move and we can still jump. However, um, you definitely notice that even just by jumping up onto a platform, I was very likely to fall on my face. Um, again, like real life. Um, but yeah, so there is there are ways to kind of check to see if they've fallen or something like that. Um, getting them back up is the problem because it would, you'd either have to restart the game or have another button input to kind of rotate them back onto their feet. Um, so that's why, in this case, we just leave freeze rotation as checked. So, but yeah, good question. Any other questions before we move on? Um, so I, hopefully you had a, at least a couple more platforms. Um, to kind of work with. Um, to kind of add some incentive to be climbing the platform is we're going to add some jewels. Um, you can think of these as coins in Mario or rings in Sonic. Basically they are to make the player feel better about themselves. Uh, and keeping in the whole rich theme, we're going to be using jewels. And they're also yellow because yellow is cool. Um, so to add the jewel sprite, uh, again, you can either right-click 2D object, but I'm just going to drag it in, um, and we can kind of see that there's our jewel. And I'll just kind of position it on the, uh, the platform, like so. And uh, if I try now to just kind of walk up into it, I will kind of either, I'll kind of disappear behind it. I won't collect it because we haven't made that yet. Um, and to actually go ahead and collect it, I'm going to do something that's kind of counterintuitive. So one thing we actually have to add is we're going to add another box collider to this jewel. Now, from what we've experienced so far is that the ground and all the platforms have a box collider. So by putting a box collider on the jewel, it doesn't make much sense because now we can just stand on the jewel, which doesn't make any sense because how will we get to it if we can't? If we can't reach it, metaphor for life, I don't know, that, that one's a stretch. But uh, what we can do is there's this checkbox that says, is trigger. Now, by checking it, is trigger, this actually makes it so this object can be walked through. So even though there is a box collider on this jewel, because we've checked is trigger, we can still walk through it. Now, the benefit to this is we can actually, I guess, walk through it. I mean, I think that explains it. I don't know where I was going with that. So now that we have that, what I want to do is I want to add, before we add the logic to the script, I want to add a sound to kind of reward the player, like, doing, I don't know, I think it's what it was. 
uh, for rewarding them for getting this coin. So just kind of some uh, audio tuned uh, feedback so they know they're doing a good job. So to add audio to the game, we're going to be adding an audio source to the player. Um, and that creates this really big complicated thing. But all we care about is this audio clip uh, at the top. And again, we can do the drag and drop, but I'm just going to hit the circle. And I'm looking for the coin sound. I'm just going to click on that. And now it's been added. One thing I would do, though, is on it says play on wake. That's checked. That means whenever we start the game, it's going to play the song or the tune. We don't want that, so we're going to go ahead and uncheck that. Uh, there's also an ability to loop it. We definitely don't want that because doing, 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 doing. No, don't, don't. You can try it, but not when I'm here, because um, I don't want to hear that. So please don't do that. Um, but now that that audio source is on the player, what we can do is again reference it from a script. So I'm going to head back to the player script, and I'm going to create a new. On the notes, a new method, and this one's going to be called. We're going to call this one uh, on trigger enter 2D, and then what we're going to pass in is we're going to pass in a collider 2D, and I'm just going to say this is other. Now this is a Unity specific method, which is why it has to be typed exactly like that. Make sure that on trigger enter and the D are all capitalized. Try to capitalize the two, but it won't work. Um, it has to be written like that. I know some of us have experience with not capitalizing it correctly. Um, I'm one of them, so um, make sure it's written like that. Make sure Collider 2D other. Uh, you can call other whatever you want. I just say other, force of habit. Um, and now what we want to do is, this is going to be called every time we enter something that has a trigger. If you'll remember, we made is trigger true for the jewel. So whenever we go ahead into this jewel, we want to collect it. So what I want to do right now is, in the future, I know that we're going to have some more triggers. Um, so what I want to do is I want to make sure that what we're running, to, running into is actually a jewel. So what I'm going to do is if other dot game object dot name dot contains jewel then we'll you know, pick it up and play a little tune. Um, and then for the record, if, you're, uh, if your sprite for some reason is not named Jewel or have Jewel anywhere in the name, this will not work. So just make sure that's known. Um, it's called Yellow Jewel, which believe it or not has Jewel in the name. So that's why I do dot contains and not dot equals. Um, especially once you start duplicating things, they start adding this one and two and so on. So as long as Jewel is somewhere in that name, you'll be good. Okay. And then in this if statement, all I want to do is I want to destroy the other dot game object. The reason for this is other in this case is the Jewel. So whenever I touch that Jewel, I want to destroy it because I don't want infinite Jewels as I'm standing on it. You might want infinite Jewels, but for the player, they probably shouldn't, they don't deserve it. Okay. Um, and then one other thing, we want to add that audio source that we just added. So we're going to do private audio source, and we're just going to call this, uh, I'm going to call this one coin sound, because that's what it is. And then the coin sound is going to be get component audio source, because that's what we've been doing for the two variables above it. And, uh, Inside of the if statement again, I'm just going to do coin sound dot play, and that just plays it once, and then we're done. So whenever we touch a jewel, it's going to pick up the jewel, and it's going to play a little victory soon, so that we know that we've actually done it correctly. And if we go ahead and try to play this, hey, I heard it. I don't know if anyone else heard it. Might have just been the voices again. Um, Hey. Okay. Um, so you're all getting it. Good, good, good. Um, and what you can do is you can add a couple more jewels just by, again, copy pasting. So do that um, as much as you want. Um, we're going to go ahead and add um, some 
kind of moves to our game now, so this isn't just a walk in the park. Again, metaphor for life. And uh, to do that, we're going to come back to our enemy sprite. Um, this one's also already broken up into three images again for your pleasure, I guess. Um, and it's just a flappy bat bird that'll flap stuff. Um, and to do that, we're just going to create a new sprite for the bat or the enemy this time. And I'm just going to say enemy. And I'm going to move him a little bit so he's kind of on the ground a little bit right there. And for the sprite, we're just going to select, uh, you know, one of the bat images. It doesn't matter which one because once we do that on the enemy, we're going to click on create animation again. And we're just going to call this enemy. And uh, I saved this to the wrong spot, but whatever. Um, and we're just going to drag in all of the all of the images again. And uh, I also want to change the sample rate down to 10 because we don't want it to flap its wings off. And then because I want that nice little loop, I'm going to put in the middle sprite again. So this will just loop over and over and over again. So if I take a look, we can just see it's flapping its little wings to its heart content. Probably has a heart, I don't know. So that's fantastic. Um, it did also create a, another controller for the enemy, but we only have one animation for this, so we don't have to worry about this really at all. We can see the default state is the enemy, and it'll just stay there forever because it never changes. So right now, same thing with the jewel when we created it. We can just walk through this enemy. That's obviously not good. So again, we're going to add a box collider to the enemy sprite. And like we did with the jewel, we're also going to make this is trigger so that we can kind of walk through it. Uh, and then we die. That's great. Um, and I'm going to add another component while on that topic of death. Uh, audio source. Another audio source. And the clip we're going to do is death. So that's great. And then uncheck play on awake because we don't want to die a lot. Sorry. Uh, we don't want to loop either because... That's that. Um, and now we need some logic to make our enemy move. You can obviously just have a static enemy, but it's boring. So we're just going to create another enemy script. Let that pull up. Now the enemy script is just going to kind of flap left to right in a kind of, I guess, a line pattern. But it'll just move left until it doesn't anymore. Then it'll move right, and it'll just kind of go back and forth. Um, and to kind of get through this, uh, to get through this script, I'm going to have a couple of variables that I'm just going to create straight up. Uh, the first one is going to be a float, and this is going to be a timer. And we'll use this to kind of determine the position of the enemy at a point in time. Um, I also want a vector three of the start position so that we can know the starting place of the bat or the enemy and this will make sense why in a second. And then because we added that audio audio uh, source we're gonna save that as a die sound so we can play it when the player dies because we should let them know they died a terrible death by this enemy. So inside of the start, I want to initialize two variables. So the start position, I just want to save as transform.position, which is my position at the start. And uh, we'll use that in a second. Um, and then the die sound, because this is a component we need to save, again, we'll do get component, and we'll do audio source. Now in update, this is where our enemy will kind of move left to right. So vector3 offset, um, the way I'm going to be doing this is I'm going to be using a sine wave. So I apologize to anyone who thought they were going to get out of math today. Um, mathf.sign, and in here we're going to pass our timer so we can kind of 
oscillate is the word, the technical word, uh, our enemy back and forth. And because we need to kind of move this position, I'm going to multiply by a vector 3 dot right. And if you hover over that, it just say that's the cheating way of saying new vector 3, 1, 0, 0. So it kind of cleans up your code there a bit. And then I'm going to multiply it by 2, so it kind of goes a bit farther than you would expect. Um, from here, I'm just going to set the position to be equal to the start position, uh, plus that offset that we just calculated above. And then finally, because we have a timer going, I want to kind of I want to update that timer as the game is going on with time time dot delta time, and that will just kind of update the time. So the time starts at zero. Second later it's one, later it's two. For those that don't remember sine, it just continues up and down forever. So this will work for what we need. But I multiply by vector three dot right, so it moves instead of moving up and down, it moves left to right. And then because we made our that or our enemy a trigger, what we should do is we should also remake that on trigger enter two D method for our enemy now. And what we should do is kind of the same logic, except this time we want to check to see if the thing we're touching is going to be the player. And if it is, we're going to play the die sound because they deserve it. And then one thing I'm actually going to do is I'm going to do other dot get component. Now this is going to get a component on the player. And the one I'm looking for is the box collider 2D. Now, if you'll remember that the box collider is what keeps the player on the ground. So to, to kind of mess with them a little bit, I'm going to do dot enabled and I'm going to set this to false. So from here, I just turned off the box collider of the player. And if you can imagine what will happen, they'll fall to the ground. So now that we have all of that, I'll come back to in a second, but make sure that you have your enemy script attached to your enemy. And if I go ahead and uh, walk towards it, I can see that it's moving left to right. And if I touch it, I hear the die sound and I fall to the floor. One thing that doesn't happen right now though is the game doesn't restart because I'm just falling forever because that is my life now. Um, so to kind of go ahead and get around that, um, I'm going to go ahead back to the player, uh, player script. And what I want to do is in the update method, I just want to check if at any point our position, our Y position is less than negative seven, I think I had, which negative seven is like down here. So if we ever fall below this line, we'll just restart the game. So if I ever if I ever get that far down, all I want to do is restart the game. Now Unity 5.3 or 4, I think, did a weird thing with scenes. So we have to do using up here Unity Engine dot scene management. And this will allow us to restart the scene. Uh, and inside of this if statement, we're going to do the really fun line that's scene manager dot load scene, and then in parentheses, we're going to do scene manager dot get active scene dot name. Now what this is going to do is it's going to load the scene of the current scene, which just restarts the scene because there is no such thing as dot restart scene because that would make too much sense. So now at this point, if the player falls below that threshold of negative seven, the game just restarts and we can just keep playing again. Um, finally, we want to add some goal to our game. So how do they know when they're done? Um, in this case, I have a goal flag sprite for you to kind of place. So there's our goal flag sprite. And I can just kind of drag it in and place wherever I want. And there it is. 
Um, and we want to make sure whenever our player touches this flag, uh, they they uh, trigger the uh, wind sound or something like that. Uh, I kind of gave it away about the trigger, but that's how we'll be knowing when the player touches this flag. Um, so again, we'll add a box collider 2D, and it adds that box collider right there. Now, if we don't do his trigger, that means that the player can never walk through it, which means that we're kind of trolling them by never allowing them to touch the flag, which you can do. I'm not going to stop you. But if we make it his trigger, that means they can actually walk to the flag and touch it. And one thing I'm actually going to do is edit the collider so that it's super duper tall. And the reason for that is if for some reason they were to jump over the flag, we still want to reward them with the sound. So I just make a really tall box trigger collider. Such so. It's not the victory sound. Speaking of the victory sound, we want to add that right now. So I'm going to add another component like we've done a couple times now. The audio source to the uh, goal flag. And in this case, we're going to play the wind theme. I don't I don't even remember what it, went, what it actually sounds like, but I guess we'll find out together. Um, we'll uncheck Plan Awake because we don't want to immediately war the player because they haven't done anything yet. Um, and we're going to have to add a new script, which I just call Go Flag because that's fantastic. Go Flag. And once that opens up, it'll just be a relatively simple strip script just so that whenever the player touches the flag, we'll reward them. It's weird when you put it that way, but it's what it is. Um, this one also has an audio source, which is the victory sound. So we'll save that component for to play later. And then, of course, in our start method, we have to get the component of that audio source, which we've done a couple times now. And then I want to update it. Uh, we don't actually need update, so get rid of that. Because the one thing we're looking for is we've done this again also a couple of few times. We want to do the whole on trigger enter 2D. We'll do collider 2D again because that's what we're looking for. And uh, if that other game object's name happens to contain player, then what we can do is just play the victory sound. And then this is where you would also do other things, like go to the next level. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it, actually. Go to the next level. Um, so that's that. Um, be sure to put the script on the object. Add component. Go flag. And now if we go ahead and get over to uh, where we need to be. That's what it sounds like. Cool. Um, and that's that. And you notice that like we can't, like we can go back, and then we can kill ourselves. Neat. <laughs> um, so that's that. Um, you might have noticed that. Obviously, did we need to actually check to see if what's touching us contains the name player? No, because really nothing else should be even going by the flag. But if for some reason you had like an enemy by the flag that was like, I guess, patrolling it, uh, you wouldn't want the enemy to trigger the victory sound because they didn't do anything to the bad guys. Um, real quick, um, what we want to do lastly is just add some UI to our game so we know how many jewels we've collected. So to do that, I'm going to right click in the hierarchy this time. There's one that says UI and I'm looking for text. Now what this is going to do is it's going to create a canvas, which is basically just a way to organize your screen layout for UI and event system. We won't be using the event system, but it's there for like uh, touch screens and stuff like that and other menu management stuff. So, But the text is uh, going to be the score, and I can just call score zero there. But you'll notice right now that our canvas is freaking huge. It doesn't need to be that big. So click on canvas and there's render mode right here for canvas and we're going to change that to be screen space instead of overlay it's going to be camera. 
Now what this does is we're going to, for the render camera, pick the only camera in the game. And what this does is it puts our canvas just right on top of our main camera. So now it's the same size. So as the camera's moving, the UI is moving with the camera, which is good because we don't want to leave that behind. Um, one thing that kind of happens weird though is that you can see that our text is kind of below the canvas. So I'm just going to reset this back to 0, 0, and we kind of see it there. Um, I have attached a font, I believe, to the package, so press start, create font. Um, and I'm going to make it white so we can actually see it. Um, and there's, you know, what I wrote and stuff like that. Um, up here at the top left, there's a weird square and circle thing, and that changes it to this mode. What you can do is just drag the text around and then resize it to kind of be in the top left corner. Um, if you're going to do that, you can either play around with font size or there's the checkbox that just says best fit. And it just does the best fit font size to fill up that square. So feel free to play around with font as much as you want or as the text as much as you want. But this is more or less the end level or the end game of what we'll be seeing with our score zero. So now that we actually have our UI set up, we need to actually update the UI as we're getting gems, or jewels, sorry. So to do that, I'm going to head back to the player movement script for one last time. And to do some UI stuff at the very top, like we did with the scene management, we're going to be doing, using Unity Engine, this time we're going to do .UI, and uh, that'll be that. And then I'm going to create two new variables. The first one's going to be an int, which is just going to be score. This will keep track of how many jewels we have. Next up, we're actually going to be saving, this is going to be public actually. And this is going to be the public text, and this is going to be the score text of the UI that we just created. So as our score is updating within the player, we'll be updating the text of the UI to match the score of the player. And uh, because text, the score text is public, we can just drag it on. But we still do need to initialize the score. Um, so we can initialize that to zero, um, like so. And now all we have to do is inside of the on sugar enter with the jewel. Um, whenever we do all this stuff, we'll just increase our score by one point. And the score text dot text will be equal to now score and then plus score. So this will just be updated every time we collect a new jewel, we'll just update the UI to say this is our new score. And so if we go ahead and save that and give this a shot, what we should see is as I'm collecting the jewels, our points will be going up. Just kidding, because one thing I didn't do is on the player script now because we made a public variable there is uh, this score text which I got some errors down here because I didn't assign it yet so I can just click and drag the text uh, so now it's there or I could have just selected the only one there um, so now if I try it I go ahead and select it our score does in fact go up and I can still I can still die to restart that's not the tune. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's that's some UI. Um, just some missed stuff to kind of make this feel more, I guess, pleasant. Um, and I don't like to do this till the end, but and you'll see why in a second. But on the main camera, I'm gonna add some theme music that's always playing. So again, we'll add an audio source, but a little bit differently. Uh, well, the same. We'll I have a main theme for you to try out. Um, Plan awake, we're actually going to leave checked because we don't. We just want this to start automatically. And then I'm going to check loop as well. So now it's just continuously playing forever. And I don't do this at the end because if you do this at the beginning, every time you play test your game, you will begin to hate the first four notes of your song. Because it happens a lot. Um, yeah, I'm not stuck with music. Um, I've also attached some plants. Um, sprites, so if you want to make it so your game doesn't look as boring, you could bring in some plants, make it look pretty, or something. I don't know. Level design, it's important. 
Um, and then another question we had was, how do I stop sticking to the platforms as I'm walking up against them? To do that, I'm going to right click in our project folder and I'm going to do create uh, physics material 2D. And what that's going to do is going to create a 2D physics material. And I called this slick, so feel free to call it whatever you want. Uh, but basically, I set the friction to be zero and the bounciness to be zero. So we have no friction and no bounciness for all the materials that this is on. To actually use this correctly, um, you have to go for all the floating platforms. I can select all of them like that. Um, on the polygon collider, there is a material that's been blank for a while. We can just select slick to be that material. We also have to apply this material to the player in the same way. Material, also select to be slick. And now if we go ahead and play by, with our new music, by the way, I should be able to just slide up the sides of the platform and I don't get stuck anymore. But I die still, so just bad. Um, from there, I, I guess it's really up to you. I would go ahead and try to make some more enemies, make some more levels, try adding lives maybe because no one likes automatically dying. So have like a mushroom power up or something like that. Um, but that, that pretty much is an entire game. Um, I know it took a little bit longer than you're expecting, so thank you for all hanging out here. Um, but hopefully with this, you can get a good idea on how to make a 2D platformer. And uh, hopefully you guys either take this and run with it or just start off from scratch and do it your own way. I won't be upset either way. But uh, yeah, good luck, guys. Go forth, make games be awesome. Thanks. Don't have any other questions before I cut it off. Yes. This will be uploaded as well. Yeah, that's fine. Do you have one? That's a good question, actually. Uh, yes, you will potentially fall through the floor if you're falling too fast. Um, so if you fall from a height, let's say, I don't know, like a thousand, let's just, you know, ballpark it. Um, if you fall off a height from a thousand, by the time you reach the ground, you'll probably, I mean, there's no terminal velocity once you put it in, so you'll be falling, I don't know, who knows, pretty fast. But what it'll do is it'll check to see the position you're at, and then it'll figure out where you'll be the next frame. And if that point in the next frame is not blocked, it'll go there. But that means you might cross a border of where you're going. So they'll actually counteract that is for your box collider, you can just make it super bigger like that. And that would be fine as well. Yeah, don't make a one pixel collider because those never work. Trust me, I've gotten through a lot of things like that. Yep. Any other questions, guys? All right, if that's it, thanks everyone. See y'all later.